And welcome everyone. Thank you so much uh, for being here for our 15th Chambers for Sustainability webinar. And um, I wanted to just recognize, I see we have really amazing leaders coming in from chambers, not just from the United States, from, from all around the world. Um, I see Mauricio right there. He's one of our really close partners. And, um, and we work with chambers through the Chambers for Sustainability Coalition. We have a number of chambers who are part of the coalition, and we'll talk a little bit about more about that afterwards, because we really want each of you to join the coalition, be part of this growing momentum. And one of our most recent endeavors that we've taken um, that have that our team has been doing beyond our webinars that we've been running at, is that we have been doing, uh, it's taken about a year, but we're We've done this study and we've done research on all the chambers within the United States and identified the ones that have been environmentally sustainable as well as socially sustainable. And I want to say the speakers who are here today are just this absolute, uh, you know, really special chambers because there's only about 3.73% the chambers that have environmental programs right now, and there are 7.49% of chambers out of 7,300 chambers that we've done research on that have social sustainability programs. So together, we want we, we want to uh, reward you and, and applaud your efforts and programs that you're doing, but we also want to make sure that those numbers grow in the next year or two. So that's hope, that's hope that we can get more chambers to be part of our coalition and be inspired by what you do. So I will hand it over to Lexi to get started. Awesome. Thanks so much, Michelle. I would first like to thank all of our speakers for joining our webinar today. Each one of them are very accomplished and have largely contributed to the sustainability sector through their chambers. Today, we have five incredible speakers joining us. We're happy to welcome Chris Edwards from the Somerset County Business Partnership, Deanna Palm from the Washington County Chamber of Commerce, Colin Diaz from the Tempe Chamber of Commerce, Monica Villalobos from the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of what Commerce, happening? and Joe Gallo from the Greater Flagstaff Chamber of Commerce. Our first speaker today will be Chris Edwards from the Somerset County Business Partnership. Chris? Thank you, Lexi. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Michelle and, and team for uh, recognizing the Somerset County Business Partnership and, and inviting uh, me to speak today. A um, little background before I get into our sustainability and DNI journey. I just put a timer on, so I know I, I can't go over. Um, I won't go over seven minutes. I promise. Um, uh, Somerset County, New Jersey, is located uh, pretty much directly in between New York and Philly. So. Uh, an hour car ride northeast is New York City, and an hour car ride southwest is Philadelphia, just to give you uh, a sense of, of where we're at. Our, our, we do tourism at our Chamber of Commerce, and our, our tagline is in the heart of New Jersey. So uh, right smack in the middle of the state. Um, everyone usually thinks we're, we're on the beach uh, at, the, at the shore, but uh, unfortunately, we're, we're not that close. Um, the, the Somerset County Business Partnership is a public-private partnership, which is unique for the state of New Jersey. Um, it might not be unique from where you're coming from, um, as we've seen a lot of uh, mid-sized chambers have these partnerships with local government. Um, ours is a contractual uh, partnership with the county to do economic development services and a partnership with the state to be a uh, destination marketing organization. So uh, like I said, pretty unique for the state of New Jersey. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about our sustainability journey and then our, our DNI journey. Um, and uh, they definitely started at, at two uh, uh, different times in our organization's history. So I'm going to share my screen here real quick. Can everyone see our strategic plan? All right, I'm seeing some nods, so we're good. Um, so our sustainability journey started uh, long before I was at this organization, probably about, uh, I think it was 15, 16 years ago. Um, and it was member driven. It was um, a bunch of companies coming together 
um, who worked uh, in the solar industry. Uh, we have um, uh, a couple of members, you know, engineering, architecture, who started, who came to us and said, we have a passion for sustainability and we think we can create an, an echo chamber within the organization to promote sustainability. Um, would the business partnership be interested? And, and we, at, at first, um, you know, I think like most special interest groups in a chamber, um, sometimes struggled a little bit to find an identity, but what we had found work most was taking real world success stories and applying them to um, how we can apply them to other members. So to give you an example, we had um, some warehousing companies uh, who put solar on their roof. So instead of having a meeting in our conference room, we actually went up to, to that warehouse, went onto the roof and took a tour, talked with the owner about why it made sense, um, how it impacted their bottom line, and um, people saw it in real time. And that that was really, um, that's really been the heart of our sustainable, we call it sustainable Somerset, which is getting uh, businesses who are in the industry to talk about um, environmental impacts, but also the bottom line to, come, uh, to, to individual businesses, how going green and being environmentally aware has, has really impacted their, their company. Um, I can tell you when I first got started, we, there was there were companies that we had to have meetings just to talk about is is climate change real? Those were a lot of the the, the conversations 10, 15 years ago. And I'm proud to say uh, we are well beyond that. Um, our our county board of com, uh, commissioners has a uh, a climate change action plan, uh, and we're at the forefront of that, helping local government come up with uh, better solutions to, to large problems. A uh, big one in New Jersey is offshore wind energy. Uh, and we're, we, we wanna be at the ground floor in, in terms of jobs, production um, and everything that comes with that. So um, so that's our sustainability uh, movement. The DNI did not come till later on in the process. Um, when I first came to the partnership 10 years ago, um, I saw very early on that we were very an, an, not so much of an inclusive chamber. It was it was a lot of uh, older white males, to be 100 percent honest. And um, we had got to a point where the board, our board of directors, challenged us in 2018 um, to be a more inclusive chamber. And that's how our DNI journey started was by the board self-reflecting and going, you know, the people who are around this table do not reflect the business community. Um, and the strategic plan that you see on your screen, that is, uh, that was uh, created in 2020 and approved by our board in January of 21. Um, and all of our programs and strategies have to come out of one of those five pillars. So you could see right at the middle, at the heart is DNI. Uh, we also have a pillar dedicated to sustainability and, and, and health and wellness, but everything we do comes out of um these action areas um we in somerset county um we're kind of known as the the medicine cabinet of of the u.s here we have a ton of uh biotech life sciences companies uh sanofi pfizer johnson and johnson abvi uh Haleon. uh they're they're all have a, a presence here in somerset county and they've been leading the way on dni for for a long time so we really start to just take what they had and 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 kind of reflecting that back to the community. So um, we uh, we saw that there was an opportunity to create four pillars within DNI, and those are uh, minority business leaders, emerging leaders, women in business, and then having a a, a countywide summit once a year. Uh, and those have been the four pillars of the organization. Uh, the last thing is I'll add as we're, we're coming up on seven minutes is. Um, we saw a big change in our larger members of the chamber in their funding. Um, government affairs used to be where we engaged with a lot of our larger companies. And as time go has gone along, that energy has shifted to DE&I activities. Um, and 
Um, if that's where the energy is, I'm sure all of you can agree who are a part of a chamber, that's that's where you have to put, <laughs> if that's where the fiscal energy is, that's where you got to put your time and attention to. Um, and all that said, it's also doing the right thing. Right at the at the end of the day, it's about doing the right thing, and and it's and it's been a, a real success story for our organization. So, um, that is that is uh, I, we hit seven minutes here. So that is uh, our story here at the business partnership. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Um, we would just like to congratulate your chamber on another successful International Women's Day luncheon last year with over 150 members in attendance. And congrats on a sold out luncheon this year as well. Thank you. Our next, yeah, you're welcome. Um, our next speaker is Deanna Palm from the Washington County Chamber of Commerce in Oregon. Deanna. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for this invitation. Thank you for letting us be a part of this conversation. Um, I was asked to talk about our diversity councils, uh, just a little bit of uh, background about our chamber. So we're the Washington County Chamber of the population in Washington County, Oregon is about 600,000. Uh, we have about 850 business members representing about 75,000 jobs. Um, and each one of our diversity councils is represented um, throughout the county. So we have folks that are all over um, participating. So we have five diversity councils, all were me member driven. So um, they came to the chamber and said, we'd like you to consider starting a, a council, whether it's our Asian Pacific, Black, um, LBGTQ, our Latino and our veterans, they were all member driven. Each one of them, as you can see, has their own unique logo, their own unique identity. They were all developed by the council members. And all of our diversity councils have a staff liaison with it. So they meet on a regular basis and make sure that um, we're in concert with what the chamber's mission is and working towards the same vision and outcomes. So our um, Asian Pacific Islander Business Advisory Council, um, they, all, they all developed their own mission statement and goals for 2023. Um, but this is our newest one. They started in July of 2022. So they're still um, rather small. They have about seven members. Um, obviously, one of their um, primary goals for 2023 is growth and getting the word out. And, and also they're, they're thinking about doing that by um, creating different social media presences regarding um, different holidays and celebrations for each one of the unique cultures that fit under the Asian Pacific Islander umbrella. It's rather large. Um, and that's been a really great way to connect um, because we, we tag the, the council, it comes back to the chamber. So, the, so people that are seeing these posts see that we have this council established and many people are very interested in the fact that, you know, especially during COVID, this was a, a population that didn't have a lot of resources and especially lang language appropriate um, resources. So very excited to have this get, getting started and looking forward to its growth. Our Black Advisory Business Council started in about the end of 2019. Um, it is our largest advisory council. It has 30 members on it, and uh, they're probably our most active as well. With that many members, they have made assignments with uh, social media. Someone takes the minutes. Somebody does the agenda for each meeting, um, and they're and so they all attend. Um, all of our events so that they can create social media posts and um, really um, get the word out about the council. It's, they've done a really great job with that. Um, and again, their, their goals are really to create um, to more economic development, prosperity, to break down barriers, and to ensure that everyone has uh, the same opportunity for economic um, prosperity. And then our Latino Business Advisory Council is our oldest standing council. It's been in existence for about 18 years. Um, the Washington County area is, is probably one of the most diverse counties in the state of Oregon, um, but we have a high percentage of Latino um, community members at probably at 28 um, to 30 percent. So we've had this council um, for a very long time. They're really focused this year on mentorship and reaching out to other small businesses that might be struggling. So they've identified their um, strengths around the table of their council. And they're reaching out to 
the small businesses and saying, if you need help with um, finance, we have someone that can help you. If you need help with marketing or social media or expanding your customer base, we have folks that can help you. Um, so that's been their focus for this year and it's going really, really well. They don't take on too many folks that they mentor so that they can really do um, a really exceptional job with them and spend time with them. This um, council also helps produce our Latino Cultural Festival, which is in its 17th year this year. Um, really big event, great opportunity for, again, uh, additional outreach and connection with different um, parts of our community. Our LGBTQ plus um, council started in 2020 and they're really focused on getting the word out. It's a smaller council as well. It's about 10 members, um, but, they're looking to expand their opportunity and to promote themselves by attending different pride events that are happening throughout the Portland metropolitan region. So they've, they've got plans to table at Portland Pride, at Beaverton Pride, um, just to, to have a presence there. And their hope and their dream is to eventually um, have a, hold their own pride event um, under the Washington County Chamber. And our Veterans Business Advisory Council started also in 2020, um, really focused in on helping um, veterans access opportunities for whether um, starting their own businesses or getting assistance and support for their, their business that they already have underway. Um, and also creating a resource um, clearinghouse, if you will. There's a lot of resources for veterans, but what we hear from veterans is that they don't really know which, which door to walk through. And so we're hoping to pull together um, a website that can bring all those resources that are available in Washington County in one place and space um, and give them the appropriate guidance on those efforts. So getting the word out, all of our um, councils are growing. And one of the ways we've been able to do that is we created rack cards for each one of them. Um, so they, they can hand them out at events and activities that they're participating in. They can um, hand them out at businesses if they visit a business that um, would potentially be interested in one of the councils, they can be, use this as a leave behind for them. We also created, um, we bought a, a huge tent for um, the, these tabling events, and each one of the councils has a flag that they can put on the tent when they're the, the diversity council that's um, present at the event. They also have their own table runners. Just again, it's a way to, to help them feel like we're marketing al alongside with them, we're helping them promote and grow these councils. Um, and I think it also shows that we're really intentional about really wanting to make sure that we're growing and that we're, we're helping them achieve their mission for each one of the councils. Just some promotion that we put together and how we get the word out. You'll note that um, several of our councils also um, do fundraisers and different types of activities for nonprofits. So they'll partner with a nonprofit like Home Plate, for example, where they help out um, homeless youth. Um, so they've done a fundraising and, and also put together toiletry kits and things like that that students could could potentially use. Um, so they, they're not just about growing their council, they're also about how do they get more connected with the community? What would that look like for them? And this is just a photo of our Latino Cultural Festival. So we um, moved it last year from uh, the streets in downtown Hillsborough to the Ron Tonkin Stadium, um, home of the Hillsborough Hops. Um, and it just grew exponentially. Very excited about this opportunity and how many more community members we were able to bring together to really enjoy the Latino culture. And so it has entertainment and food and Futsal, you can see it in the backdrop there. Um, so really just a celebration of the culture. Just an, another couple of pictures of things that um, our councils have been doing. We also launched our first Juneteenth event last year. Um, and this year, it's one of our signature events. So very excited about that opportunity and watching that event grow. It's the first Juneteenth event ever held in Washington County. 
um, our diversity councils get together on a quarterly basis. So um, they do a happy hour and networking. So it brings them all together. They share with what they're doing, how they're growing, different um, things, challenges that they might be having. And it's really just a great way for them to get to know each other um, and, and learn about how they can potentially grow. I know that our Black Advisory Business Council has kind of been, um, you know, the the leader in terms of getting the word out and all of our other councils are, are really trying to figure out how they can match that as well. And then fi finally in September, we do a DEI um, conference or symposium and our councils are all participate in what that program's gonna look like. They help pick out the speakers, they design the agenda, they make sure that they're fully involved in all of that. And I would just say the one final thing, which I think is the most important thing about our councils, and it was very intentional. Each one of our councils um, nominate an, a, a recommendation for a board member. So each one of our councils has a, a seat at our board of directors, and it's not an ex officio board member. It's a full voting board member. We really think it's important that we're in our boardrooms, they're setting policy. And we wanna make sure that we're not setting policy or taking a position on an issue that has any sort of inherent racism or bias included in that. And these folks need to be around the table to help us see the things we don't that we don't know. We don't have those kind of lived experiences. And I think that's been the most rewarding is really making sure that um, they have a voice to everything that's happening in the chamber. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deanna. As you mentioned in your presentation, we'd like to applaud your chamber for putting on your annual Washington County Chamber Latino Cultural Festival for the 17th year. Now we're going to transition over to Colin Diaz from the Tempe Chamber of Commerce. Colin. Well, thank you for having me join you all today. This is a, an amazing group to be joining so i'm gonna make sure i'm sharing the correct thing on my screen and you guys let me know uh, when you are able to see it correctly one second so you guys see tempe chamber pledge it's still coming up is it okay let's see there's always one with tech trouble i was hoping it wouldn't be me but I'll, I'll give a little bit of background while it's uh, loading. Um, I've been president here at the chamber for a little under a year. In fact, uh, a couple of weeks from now, it will, in fact, be a year. And is it showing now? It's not showing yet, but um, maybe we could have uh, Mary Lim share it. Uh, or go ahead and try one more time. Oh, there it goes. We can okay. see it. I, I apologize for that. I don't know what happened. But um, in 2016, we started our uh, sustainability pledge. The city of Tempe, to give a little bit of background, uh, we are just east of the city of Phoenix in Arizona. Um, we've got the largest public university in the country and Arizona State University, which has done a lot of work in sustainability. Our city of Tempe is, is pretty well uh, poised and focused on sustainability. And so in 2016, going to 17, we started our pledge. And so I'll share a little bit with you about that. I know uh, the other folks that have been speaking have shared some of their DEI work, which we're moving a lot into as well. Um, and I will share some on that, but I want to be cognizant of time. So please let me know that you see the screen move to the next screen. Okay, yes. so our, thank you. So our pledge is uh, essentially looking at a sustainable community. And the first thing that we established was that it, we could not, we could no longer look at a single bottom line, you know, in terms of just profitability that we needed to look at a triple bottom line of a healthy community, a beautiful uh, natural environment and a strong economy. And so obviously as a chamber of commerce, the economy matters, but we wanted to make a case for how those things all tie to one another. And as a result, came up with five focal points. So that was energy, water, travel, waste, and purchasing. And so with energy, that one's probably self-explanatory. A lot of people were well aware of that as we talked about it, but just looking at the usage that you have and reducing that in some spaces that was looking at the lighting that they had, uh, lights that have timers as people were leaving the building as opposed to leaving them on. 
um, water that would be uh, automatically started and stopped and low flow toilets, things of that nature, um, flowing right into water, being good stewards of water. Uh, in Arizona, unfortunately, we've been uh, on uh, national news, if you will, for a lot of the water issues. Um, one of the things that I am proud of, though, locally and even throughout the state, uh, companies like uh, SRP, the Salt River Project, has been forecasting this for quite a while. And so though we also have to be very cognizant of what we're doing with water, we have been making steps here in Tempe and the East Valley to, to curb that water uh, usage. Um, but we're also forecasting a two and a half million person increase in population over the next 10 years. And with that in, uh, comes a demand on roadways, a demand on resources. And so we want to be really proactive with our business community as well as our resident community and what we're doing. Travel, similarly, uh, looking at the motorized transit methods. Uh, we've got light rail here in Tempe. We also have a streetcar. So we're looking at the at micro transit right now as ways for employees to move throughout our city and the East Valley. And then waste, reducing the amount of waste that is being used, being a little bit more green. Uh, we currently are working with uh, a few of our nonprofits in the city, as well as the city itself, uh, in addressing homelessness. And one of the things that we did this last year, uh, if you've not been to Arizona in the summer, um, I'd probably advise not to come during the summer, but for my Arizona colleagues that are on here, they know it gets to be a little bit warm. And so for those unhoused, uh, we wanted to try to, uh, as many of those as we could get housed, we tried to, but for those that were gonna be uh, transient, we were we introduced um, uh, reusable water bottles and filling stations and other uh, sustainable methods for uh, trying to aid them during the, the summer months and in some of our programming. And then purchasing, I thought it was important to look at the procurement model. Uh, this ties into our DEI initiatives where we're looking at uh, uh, diverse supply chain. So companies that are being a little bit more intentional in where they're purchasing from, who they're purchasing from, uh, trying to reduce when possible um, some of the interaction that's overseas and bringing some of it more localized, which is also impacting the environment. Uh, so what do we do? The, the initial is uh, all of it is data driven. So we, we've pulled data from the city of Tempe. We've been pulling our own data and polling our members as well. Uh, it's a tiered system. And this is one thing that I, I particularly like. We didn't wanna have something where if you were further along in the process, what we're doing or suggesting might be remedial. If you hadn't started yet, it might be too advanced. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges for folks is it seems too daunting. So people would rather do nothing. Um, businesses were doing nothing. And so our uh, how-to, if you will, is tiered. Uh, based off of whether you're at basic, intermediate, or advanced. We have a resource hub that has tons of uh, videos, trainings, ideas, but the best part probably on it is the money saving rebates for changes that businesses could make and what that process would look like. And then a step-by-step. -step. So our goal is initial assessment for businesses, where they're at. Uh, this is not just a management process. This is a top to bottom process and getting employees to have buy-in getting them engaged and taking the pledge essentially, uh, and then growing their impact. So these are our, our kind of initial and ongoing program sponsors. Uh, you can see to the left, the city of Tempe, Arizona State University, and then one of our larger or one of our local banks in the Silicon Valley Bank are our platinum sponsors. And then in the middle, another energy partner, uh, energy partners, um, APS and SRP and State Farm. And then we've got about, I want to say 45 businesses that are that have uh, taken the pledge this year, and we're you know working on increasing those numbers as well. Uh, but currently, and what we have on the trajectory, I mentioned what we've done in terms of the homelessness effort. Uh, but we have an annual sustainability summit where we bring in experts and industry leaders to talk about just the, not only the current challenges, but um, steps that businesses could take to elevate the programming they have. We've created a portal both online on our social media and in our newsletter the spotlight success stories. Uh, so those that have been doing a really good job of not only moving the needle on that, but getting buy-in from their employees. We've had some that have built programs so well that they've tracked it into the households of their employees, which is something that I think uh, ultimately we're, we're happy to see. 
And then moving forward, we're in the process. Uh, we procured money from the city to hire a sustainability intern who will uh, help us um, do a little bit more tracking in terms of the data with our businesses. Uh, we'll be working with ASU and the, the city of Tempe and moving the needle on some of the future programming. And then in January, we'll have our first annual um, health, wellness, and sustainability summit because that's really a nexus of uh, sustainability has a, a central place in health and wellness as it relates to emotional, physical, and uh, financial wellness. And so we're looking forward to that event. Uh, and I know that there'll be time on the back end for questioning. The last thing that I'd, I'd like to add, we've uh, worked with the city of Tempe and we're able to procure $800,000 um, which we've now administered to BIPOC, so Black, Indigenous, People of Color, micro-manufacturing businesses uh, in the city of Tempe and have uh, procured or worked with 27 businesses to help them elevate the work that they're doing in manufacturing and just uh, secured another $250,000 in partnership with Wells Fargo to grow that impact. So definitely looking at... Um, how we can work in terms of sustainability with the environment, but also for jobs and for folks that are living in the uh, Phoenix Metro. Colin, before you before you close out, um, Shirley from the East Boston Chamber of Commerce requested that you please show the slide again that shows the triple bottom line listing. I believe this is the slide she might be referring to. I think. Is that the one you wanted, Shirley? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Colin. We're so impressed with the Tempe's chamber policy efforts. There were 11 chamber supported bills signed into law between 2020 and 2021. Our next speaker is gonna be Monica Villalobos from the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Monica. Thank you so much, Lexi, I really appreciate it. Thank you all. Um, my name is Monica Villalobos and I serve as president and CEO of the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Our organization is 75 years old. We were established in Arizona in 1948 and we're celebrating our 75th anniversary today. We're a $3 million organization making over $200 million impact. And we measure that by access to contracts, access to financing and job creation. Uh, we have about 1200 general members and of the estimated 90 Fortune 2000 companies in the state of Arizona, uh, we have an investment relationship with over 80 of them. And I want to thank um, my counterpart at the Tempe Chamber, Colin, just remember it's a dry heat. He's new to Arizona um, and we keep saying it's just a dry heat, but uh, it does make you feel a little like you're in a microwave. So um, in any case here at the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, um, this has been an area, sustainability in general has been an area for us because we know that Latinos in general are predisposed to sustainability efforts because of their countries of origin where basic sustainability like recycling is already very, very common. And we focus a lot on the data. Um, one of our pillars of excellence is market intelligence, making sure that there's a lot of thought leadership in the work that we do. And so when we turned to the data a few years ago, we came across some really interesting statistics. Um, nearly one out of every two Latinos uh, lives in the most uh, ozone polluted cities uh, in the country. Um, more than 23 million uh, Latino children, grandparents, siblings, and friends face higher risks of asthma, bronchitis, and even death from air pollution. And then finally, the Center for Disease Control estimates that 84% of all Hispanic Americans live in counties that frequently violate ground level ozone standards. And so we really knew that we were onto something here. Um, in fact, we hosted our Power of the Purse women's uh, annual event and focused on sustainability and really heard from the subject matter experts about the 
disproportionate impact that uh, climate change has on Latinos. And so I think one of the most interesting things that we took away is that um, it felt as if Latinos weren't even being in, you know, invited to the table. In fact, seven in 10 Latinos in the US have never been contacted by an organization to reduce global warming or climate change. And so sustainability in the Latino community, whether you're talking about um, you know, residents or businesses um, is really a, a priority. Again, we know that seven in 10 Latinos think global warming should be a high or very high priority um, for the president and Congress. Um, and, and so those are indicators that the Latino community simply has not been as involved and hasn't been invited to this conversation, um, which is so critical uh, because of the impact. So as we went through all of that research and culled through pages and pages of you know, disproportionate uh, impacts on the Latino community, we said, you know, we really need to focus on this and certainly educate our stakeholders um, on this. And I'm just going to share um, a publication um, that we put out and I will definitely also um, put this link, oops, sorry, put this link in um, the chat box. Um, but we put together a publication called the, oops, here we go. Can you all see that on the screen? Excellent. So we put together sustainability best practices white paper, really focusing on businesses and what businesses are doing here in Arizona um, to make sure that, you know, we're following all of those, um, doing our part in essence is what it was. And we worked again with subject matter experts, with corporate partners to really understand what it takes to put together a viable sustainability platform, not just for large corporations, but for small businesses so that they could start at the very beginning. Um, and you'll see a lot of different quotes, a lot of different data in here from all of our corporate partners. Um, and I just wanna call your attention. And as I said, I'll put this in the chat box as well. Um, but at the very end, we have our sort of next steps and um, a chart for companies to better understand where they are in this process. And so this chart here on the right really talks about those different levels of commitment that you need within an organization um, to be able to have a sustainability platform that makes a difference and that really impacts the entire organization. Just like diversity and inclusion, sustainability needs to be something that is sewn into the fabric of an organization. It's not an initiative. It's not a project. It's not a task force, right? This is something that everyone participates in, whether you're in a large company or a small company. And so this is some of the information that we've been sharing. You'll see on the left side, we do have um, many different resources as well. And we've found that all of our stakeholders uh, corporate partners, small businesses, um, just general citizens, as well as legislators have taken this work and really built upon it. Um, but this is an ongoing effort that we have um, to help us educate all of our stakeholders on you know, what's, what we can do. I think oftentimes, particularly in minority communities, sustainability and anything green is considered a little bougie, right? This is something that wealthy people can afford to do, not that ordinary people can, um, can afford to do. And nothing could be further from the truth. It's going to take all of us. And that's why at the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, we're completely committed to making sure that we're sharing as much information as we have, as we can. And as you come across other resources, um, I would welcome that because we can share that um, with our stakeholders here in Arizona as well. And again, I'll put that link in, um, in the chat box. Thank you so much, Monica.
We'd also like to mention that the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce has published Datos for 26 Years, which is a compilation of research on the impact of Hispanic peoples in the Arizona workforce. Our last speaker is Joe Galley from the Flagstaff Chamber of Commerce. Joe? I think, Monica, if you're able to unshare your screen, that would be great. Yep. I <laughs> have, again, lost the little bar. Um, are you able to just kick me off by any chance? Um, oh, there, there we go. go. <laughs> Thank you. Greetings, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. I'm Joe Galley. I'm the Senior Advisor of Public Policy at the Greater Flagstaff Chamber of Commerce. I've been at the Greater Flagstaff Chamber from 2005 to 2012. Uh, Flagstaff is a town of about 85,000 people that uh, is uh, two hours north of uh, Phoenix. I moved back to the metro area of Phoenix in 2012 and ran a smaller chamber in the Scottsdale area for uh, two years. And then I came back to the Greater Flagstaff Chamber in 2018. And I've been here in this position since that time. Uh, let's get this slide show going. I'm gonna talk a little bit today. Uh, our chamber, by the way, Monica, 75 years, congrats. And to all our uh, chambers out there, congrats for your longevity. We, have, we celebrated 130 years in 2022. We were founded in 1892, believe it or not. So uh, quite a footprint and establishment here in Northern Arizona. We have about 1,000 members, uh, ticked down a little bit during COVID and have bounced back up since we've come out of the global pandemic. I'm going to talk about two things that we're doing uh, program-wise at the Greater Flagstaff Chamber of Commerce to recognize our business members for their daily work that they do uh, to minimize their impact on the environment. Uh, these are just some general goals that we have for sustainability. First, uh, we want to obviously incentivize sustainability through broadcasting the efforts of our local businesses. We do that on a regular basis. Uh, we help them define standards uh, for businesses and nonprofits so that they can uh, have goals that they can move forward. We partner with our business leaders and have education programs that help them implement their strategies. And uh, we influence local policy by leading with the business first movement that incentivizes self-regulation of environmental strategies we have a green business certification program. I'm going to talk about that first. Uh, uh, we work towards, uh, obviously, creating standards of sustainable business practice. We recognize, as I mentioned before, our business and nonprofits for their current efforts. We do this uh, by asking them to complete an application that's available at our website, flagstaffchamber.com. And uh, when they do submit the application, uh, and highlight that the things that they're doing in their local business, we, uh, we go out and provide them uh, a special logo designed sticker that they can put on the door of their retail or commercial center, wherever they're located. We give them a certificate. We list them on our business and, and we include them in our e-news twice monthly. And then we push out our presentation of our certificate through uh, our social media channels, which uh, gets a lot of traction through Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. <clears throat> Large followings there for us throughout Northern Arizona, and we get a lot of traction on some of these tactics to help promote uh, our green business members through this certification process. This has been uh, well received. I would say it's taken some time for this to get off the ground. Uh, but we do have a handful of business members that have uh, taken the initiative to fill out the application, turn it back into us, and it is picking up steam. And we do have good support. We were able to create uh, some financial support for our chamber through one of our uh, great utility partners, Arizona Public Service, and they supported us in promoting this, and this is an ongoing program. The other and more successful um, 
uh, program for us is our Green Business of the Year Award. And we've done this twice now. We did this once in February of 2022 was our first annual Green Business Award that went to Mother Road Brewing Company. Uh, you can see here, Mother Road is one of our local brewers here in Northern Arizona. And for all those uh, fellow Arizonans on this call that don't like the heat between April and September in the Metro Phoenix and Metro Tucson areas, you can come up to Flagstaff and experience Mother Road Brewery uh, on your own in our cooler temps up here. Uh, Mother Road uses carbon capture technology that allows the capture of CO2 waste in their um, uh, emissions in their production process, which is really great. Uh, and they have an ongoing partnership with the Arizona Game and Fish Department where the proceeds from their beer sales go to help protect Arizona's unique species. They were our 2022 annual meeting uh, Green Business Award recipient the first year. And then I'm gonna get into a little more detail. We only had three nominations in 2022. We had a handful of nominations in 2023. You can see here, I, I won't read all the bullet points, but I will highlight some, uh, some bullet points, but talk more specifically about these particular businesses. Arizona Public Service is, a, is a, our electricity provider in Northern Arizona and in other parts of the state. We're a great partner with our chamber and they have tremendous programming that they have ongoing. You can see some of the things that they're doing. Obviously a larger business, right? Being the, one of the state's premier electricity providers. Arizona Snowball also has somewhere upwards of a thousand employees. Uh, and has moved from just being a seasonal ski recreation resort to being a full year recreation resort in Northern Arizona. And so a larger business, our High Country Motor Lodge, our Quality Connections and Shift uh, Kitchen and Bar were smaller businesses. We took all five of these uh, nominations for this year's award and we, we actually gave out two awards. So we decided to give a larger business Green Business Award and a smaller business Green Business Award in 2023 at our annual meeting. Our annual meeting is uh, uh, when we do our Athena Awards and we have a keynote speaker and we typically have about 500 people at our local conference center in a ballroom for a few hours to listen to our chamber message. And so we've got, we've got the key leaders of our community. We have their attention and part of our programming is showing and highlighting these key businesses and the work that they're doing to lessen their footprint on the environment. Uh, I wanna highlight one thing uh, that, that the recipient in the larger business award this year was Arizona Snowball. And uh, Arizona Snowball uh, during the 2022-23 season had partnered with one of our local uh, beverage providers uh, to process 1,300 pounds of aluminum and plastic recycling, equating to about 30,000 empty cans. The other exciting thing about Arizona Snowball is that they've been partnering with our public transportation system in Flagstaff to get skiers from downtown up to the mountain. They've done 82,000, over 82,000 trips since 2015, and this has uh, reduced over uh, single occupancy vehicles not driven, uh, that's a, over 1 million miles that were not driven by using the bus system and their partnership, saving 468 metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions. And they also partner with the National Forest Foundation for, uh, for forest thinning and some other restoration projects, which you think are really good. They were the recipient this year in the larger business and Quality Connections is a local nonprofit. They won the smaller business uh, Green Business Award this year. Those folks are great. They they work with our local business community to uh, reduce waste uh, in the e-waste uh, arena. So they they pull back uh, on uh, old monitors and computers and keyboards and mice and things that uh, you might think about just throwing in the can and that might end up in the landfill. And so they're very proactive about that. And they also have a printer cartridge recycling program. And they have a tremendous impact on reducing the environmental footprint of those specific things in our community. And they do it as a nonprofit. And they do it in partnership with our developmentally disabled community. 
And so they have a very strong social reach too as well. And they were our recipient. Uh, so a little different take than, than some of the speakers before me talk more about the broad brush strokes and what those folks are doing in their communities that are great. I'm glad to have an opportunity to share some of the specifics about how we use regular programming at our Chamber of Commerce to highlight and then hopefully grow by example uh, to our business members uh, how they can do better by looking at their peers and seeing their peers elevated. And so that's kind of our ongoing strategy. And with that, I'm happy to turn it over for questions. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, thank you so much, Joe. We'd also like to mention that the Greater Flagstaff Chamber of Commerce uniquely supports and promotes its local businesses and nonprofit leaders through a podcast called Chamber Biz Buzz, where they share the stories behind their ventures. With that, we have concluded all of our speakers for today. We would like to thank the panelists for sharing their important initiatives. We firmly believe that with the implementation of programs like these, we can achieve a more sustainable environment and get one step closer to a greener future. We chambers have a very powerful influence over our business members and therefore communities as a whole. With this, we can change the course and mindset of our society. So once again, thank you so much, Chris, Deanna, Monica, Colin, and Joe for joining us today. I'll now hand it over to Zaida, who will be leading our Q&A for today. Thank you, Lexi. So it's now time for our Q&A. So if anyone has any last minute questions, feel free to send them in the chat right now um, so they can get answered by our speakers. So one question we have here and is open to all the chamber leaders, um, how have your sustainability efforts attracted younger members? I can jump in on that, it's real simple. We have uh, a very active young professionals program and our young folks uh, younger than me by far are active in the business community. They're very keen on sustainability and environmental awareness. And so when they see our chamber members, older business folks who are well-established in the community that they're leading again by example, uh, they're excited to support those businesses and uh, and then learn how they can translate uh, what those businesses are doing into their daily work as well. Thank you, that's amazing to hear. Does anyone else have anything to add? And maybe who's guiding the sustainability initiatives? Um, who, who are the ones that maybe started it? I know Chris alluded to that a little bit, but who else can have a story as far as is it the younger generation that's helping to push this or is it coming from those larger corporations um, that have, have started their own initiatives and in DEI or other? Yeah, I mean, for, for Somerset County Business Partnership, uh, our sustainability efforts were uh, first launched by people who were very passionate about the industry, but have been sustained by uh, younger, a uh, younger generation. I mean, we found not just in sustainability and DNI, but um, most of our younger members have really expected expressed interest in not doing just pure networking events, kind of the what I always call the classic chamber model. And they want initiatives. They want something to kind of sink their teeth into. So um, I, I think just having causes period are, are, are what's attracting younger uh the younger generations to the to these organizations yeah thank you thank you so informative and i know we want to respect everyone's time and we only have about two minutes left um so i want to i want to thank everyone first and foremost our speakers, number one. I mean, this is our 15th uh, Chambers for Sustainability webinar. And I'll say every single time that we have these webinars, the stories and the programs are elevated exponentially. Um, you know, we might have started out with saying we have a small sustainability committee, we're trying to figure things out, maybe back in the beginning, um, to where I see such exponential growth in both the social sustainability programs and the environmental ones. Um, it's really inspiring to hear that 
you know, we want to jump into offshore wind energy. Um, and one of our prior speakers, their chamber is gun ho in that and making tons of money doing so. So there's so much money to be made here in addition for our members as well as uh, just the community as a whole. So I wanted to just say briefly, we invite everybody to join the Chambers for Sustainability Coalition. And I'll drop in the link um, actually into chat uh, right now. And I'll, this is the website, uh, the web page that I'm on. But we invite you to go through this. It's really simple. Um, you can watch this video here that talks about why we exist, why we were formed, some of the different members who are part of our coalition. Um, it's free. We're not asking for anything. We know chambers struggle as, um, as they're growing and especially as they're trying to implement these sustainability practices. We want to come together. This is a coalition. We want to learn from each other. We want to share best practices and be there as a support. And um, this is just, we have the San Francisco Chamber, the Metro Atlanta Chamber. Um, so we have big chambers, small chambers, um, uh, multinational chambers that are part of this, um, some green chambers uh, as well. So we invite everybody to be a part of this. And, um, and we also, again, you can watch the past recordings that we've done. So if you are interested in any particular area or sector, you can go back and we'll also be putting this up online. So again, I just want to say thank you so much to our speakers and thank you to our staff as well. We couldn't do this without you. Um, lots of time and energy went into putting this together. So please join us. We welcome you and, um, and thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.